can we predict 3D structure from first principles? In principle, and this goes back to experiments from Epstein and Anfinsen in, in the 60s, sequence uniquely determines structure. What does it mean? The sins. It's very clear, yes. Some of you look at me as if there's... Uh, how can I say what in means? It means in. Uh, no, but the point that I wanted to mean, make is it has two implications. One is that you put a protein into a solvent, any solvent, I mean, any sort of uh, solvent as it is in the cell, without any other protein being there, without any other helper agent. Just the protein into uh, a space outside of a cell and it adopts a unique three-dimensional structure. Unique means always the same. Right? And this implies, in principle, if the protein knows how to do that, we should be able to predict it. We should be able to simulate that, because if the protein does this, then this is simply energy minimization, right? You have a molecule exposed to its environment, and it adopts some conformation that is optimal. And that is simply uh, a physics simulation, and that means that protein folding, which is the process of adopting a, th a three-dimensional structure, should be doable by physical principles, by first principles. And in fact, there was a publication in the 60s in the Washington Post the protein folding problem has been solved. There was another one in the 70s in the New York Times this time the protein folding problem has been solved and there was the, another one in the 90s. Okay, this is obviously strange, right? You cannot solve the same problem three times. Uh, so what, what, what do you believe happened? So the science that we discuss here does not make it to top pages of Washington Post or New York Times every day. So these are really big, big moments. What happened? What do you believe? It's too trivial? So what happened is that people believed they had solved it by having a method that really does it and it did turn out to be not right. Because essentially what they did is worked for, they tested their methods, whatever method they had, for whatever structure they had. In the 60s there were very few, in the 90s there were still not that many. All right, And essentially those methods had optimized some of the features of the structures that they knew. And new structures came and essentially turned out that the methods did not quite work. And in fact assessment is very difficult. How could you assess a method? How could you come up with an idea that would make it less likely that the public press or some prominent press as the most important newspapers in the world uh, say that something works that doesn't work. If you worked on, on protein structure prediction then it would be sort of part of what you do, right? And you, it's, it's in your interest that you sort of see to it that the field is not making claims that are not supported. So what could you do? Any idea? How could you avoid that? Test it. Well, yeah, sure. Use, use, use protein structures experimentally now. Yeah. Uh, hide some protein structures uh, that, and pretend that you don't know them and, and test on those. This is all what those guys did. They were, not, they were not idiots. They were very clever people. They did all of that. Come up with something better. What could you do? What is foolproof? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I take your point here. Uh, there is no foolproof situation. There, there always will be a way to. Uh, okay, what is the closest you can get to foolproof? <laughs> I take your point. I fully take your point. Um, so ultimately what you are looking for is that you develop a method and you want to test this method on something that is not there today. Well, the problem is you cannot test it on something that is not there today. You cannot test it today on something that is not there today. But is there something like that that you have heard of? 
some idea that is sort of similar. So that brings us to the CASP competition. Uh, this CAFA 2 uh, critical assessment of structure prediction CASP started this idea. Uh, there is, and this is sort of a typical uh, CASP experiment, they go biannually. Uh, this year is a CASP year. Uh, from, say, April to May, the organizers collect experimental structures. In fact, Experimental structures, and this is no longer true, the statement that used to be true, uh, but experimental structures, they collect information from colleagues who do experimental structure determination who tell them we are going to have a structure over the next months. Today, nobody in the world knows the structure for protein X, but in two months we will know it. And we, the organizers collect these cases. From June to August, there's prediction season, uh, that means that methods will, be sub will see the sequences of these proteins that people are working on. And they can predict, and the deadline typically is the moment that the structure is published or then uh, in organizing CASP, the CASP organizers learned that, that published is too late, at the point of review. So the moment this is sent out for review, that's the deadline for, for CASP. So that nobody in the world, except for the group working on it, uh, experimentally working on it, so nobody else knows the structure, and that is as long as people can develop, uh, throw their methods at it. Then comes a period of time when assessors simply look at the experimental structures and the, pr the predictions and compare them, and then comes the time in December when they meet. Okay? Uh, and so CASP started, and this is an old slide here, it started in 94, in the first 10 years you see the number of groups and the number of predictions in red here shooting up. The main message is that the only thing in terms of structure prediction that really works reliably is homology modeling. And I'll get back to that, what that means a little bit later. This implies that in fact there is no general prediction of 3D structure from sequence yet. Full stop. So this is an old slide, but the statement is still true. Now, you have a question? Uh, uh, don't worry, I just had hoped there was a question. Uh, so th this, this statement is no longer strictly true as I say it, because today we have methods that predict 3D structure from sequence alone but only for some tiny subset of all the proteins. Uh, I'm, the way the lecture goes, I will not really get to those. Uh, on, this, on the scale of 20,000 human proteins, for 100 of those, we can predict structure now from sequence. Uh, so for 19,000 something, we cannot. So this still is true, but we can for many do this, and that is what I will talk about today and, and next yeah. uh, week. Uh, there are many important improvements in many fields, and I'm sorry for the uh, problem with the slide here, the overlay, and one of the big developments was that people created servers, and then they sort of collected the data from different servers and meta servers, and then they created meta 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 servers, and there were was several levels of meta servers, because it consecutive CASP, the winner often were the ones who were the best in integrating all the servers. So the ones that used best uh, all, the, all the results. So there are some problems with CASP. One uh, is that every year the number of proteins is, is really limited. Uh, and this was from a, a year in which uh, there were about 100 proteins. Now Say we have a method uh, that uses 53 and of these 100 and reaches a performance X. And then we have another method B that uses 35 uh, and reaches X plus Y, where Y is a positive number. Uh, is B better than A? No, maybe just use the current percentage. Exactly. It could be that there is a subset, and in fact, it not only could be, so methods very soon, so if there is an advantage of winning, I assume that everybody in the room is clever, and if you get a prize for winning, you come up with clever ideas how to win, whatever that takes. You may, sometimes you may call it cheating, sometimes we may call it, it's all the same, you try to win, right? So selecting the best ones, or the ones where you do the best performance, is sort of a good recipe to get a high number, right? And so some people did, in fact, exactly do that. They, because initially in the first cast, people did compare these numbers directly. 
And then people simply optimized that by whatever the method looked at had a low reliability, they didn't submit. Only when they were very reliable, so that they got a very high number here. Um, so no, you cannot say that because you have to really compare. The next issue really is, are 100 proteins enough? Uh, so, so the first statement we already have, have done, the next question is, uh, is, is the, the number, whatever the number is, is that big enough? So we have to compare identical sets, and then the question becomes, is the, well, how is the error rate for whatever set we have? Uh, now, the other issue is the one that has to do with ranking. So when can we rank methods? Ranking means, I say that method one has the numerically highest level number, and method number two has the numerically second high, highest level. Uh, and three is just tiny bit worse, but tiny bit worse, and has the third rank, but if the little bit worse is within the error estimate, you can actually not rank. Okay, so here's another question. Uh, the question is, obviously, P.S. idea, in, in fact, I confuse your names, uh, don't I? That's what I'm supposed to do better. So Natalie, I, so I define Natalie as Pia. <laughs> well, why, why, why are you not both called Pia? Anyway, uh, Pia, well, one I was right. I'm sorry for that. Uh, so the. I have 100 proteins, I know 53 and 35 I cannot compare. What I demand is that I compare based on the same set. I have to compare apples with apples. Now if I compare apples with apples, here is actually a slightly different version of this apples and apples. I have 29 proteins because in fact it turns out, uh, so there's some reality behind this, uh, that I said here's one with 53 and one with 35, so I'm going to compare a bunch of methods and the one with the fewest number here was 29. So I could take, since one method has 29 proteins, I could compare different methods all using 29. Or I could use 11 identical. So for the year in which I had 100 proteins, and I compared six or seven methods in the next slide. I do not remember how many. Um, I can also not see it here. Some, some, some ballpark like that, six methods. Uh, and only 11 of these 100 were identical between these seven prediction methods. So I have two options. I can assess on the 11, or I can say, assess on the 29. What should I do? Because you immediately see 100 is a small number, but 11 is a much smaller number. And 29 is not a big number, but is substantially larger than 11. This is a third of the data set, that's a tenth of the data set. This is sort of a, is a big step down in some sense. What should I do? You don't know. What would you do? So, this is the kind of thing, if you, if you write your thesis, uh, you could r r ask your neighbor. In this particular case, the neighbor, everybody uh, in the room of cast said 29 was the answer, or not everybody, but uh, I, I asked many people at that point. Um, so the Google answer would have been 29. Uh, it's not always the right thing to do. In this particular case, 11 is the better answer. But how could you find out whether it's the better answer? What could you test? So the idea is the following. If I had six methods, for those six methods I have a comparison of hundreds of proteins. For, I have a comparison between these methods and I actually know the real ranking. And then I try this experiment here. I know the outcome for a large data set. And I ask for this small data set here, how would I predict the outcome? How would the ranking differ? So if I rank them based on that, and if I rank them based on that, which one would come closer to what I know is the real ranking? And the answer is here, and it's very complicated. Uh, so this is number of random draws, this is 29 proteins, this is 11 proteins. And 
I understand that there is not much data on it and that is very clear for you to understand everything that is on this slide in two seconds. Uh, and since it's so trivial, let's not talk about it, okay? Uh, this is too trivial to really... Baseline is, as I said, this identical 11 gives a much better estimate, so there's much less diversity in there. I understand that you don't see that, because I give you a very complicated slide. Uh, but here, down here, you see uh, the, 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 the space of ranks that particular methods go into, and this happens to be secondary structure prediction. Uh, and so you see that the ranks here are much more widespread than the ranks for the second method. Uh, in particular, methods that are, are really poor uh, predictors, and this is something that I'm, I'm happy to, to acknowledge because that is a method that I developed at some point. So this is clearly in the set that is in front of me, I believe clearly was the worst method. Uh, and it still gets in some rankings for the 29 third place. Uh, well, here it gets fourth place, but still. So the, the, this, the, 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 the method B is, although 11 is much smaller than 29, using identical protein is way better. Uh, another way in which we could get out of that problem, and that was later then adopted uh, by CASP as a method, is the following idea. So in choosing your identical subset, you're not finding the 11 that are identical between all eight methods. Well, instead, what you're going to do is you're going to compare method A to method B. And when you compare A to B, you look at the ones that are identical between these two. And then you ask, is A substantially better, substantially means above the statistical error, standard deviation, then B. If yes, it's, it's blue, and the more better, it's the bluer, the darker the blue. So in both cases here, it's, it's, it's A is better than B, and is even more better than, than C, right? Uh, and for D, because of whatever reason, I cannot make this statement. They don't have enough of an overlap, uh, or they are not that different. Uh, and so forth. Red, the dark red means substantially worse. Okay, it's the inverse of that statement. So from a bunch of pair comparisons, you essentially ask substantially better, and then you extract from this matrix some ranking. And this ranking, uh, so the simplest way of doing that is you would say uh, that D is uh, better than two methods, A is better than two methods, so A and D get both first rank. You can possibly not distinguish on the level of saying, well, he is, he is a lighter blue and he is a darker blue. So D is a little bit better uh, because it has more darker blues, depending on how you do it, but possibly your method will not be able to say that. Why Natalie. Is my, my quick answer to that question is there's a mistake somewhere. It's absolutely, can absolutely, wait a minute, wait a minute, it's inverted, right? Is the inverted on metric? Symmetric? No, it's not. So this one here is A is better than B. Uh, when you do B to A, is B is worse than A. In that sense, it's not symmetric. But, but then is it still not true? Not From that, so if, if we invert the, the colors, is it still not symmetric? Then it would be an error. B and C is B and C. B is worse than C, and C is worse than B. Yeah, that is complicated. So this is a... Okay. <laughs> yeah, this is one of my, my examples. Yes, that is obviously wrong. That does not make any sense. And also this one doesn't make sense here. Yeah. Um, that cannot be. So my conclusion is off with the diagonal. It's only confusing <laughs> when I make examples. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Okay, so 3D information from, from experimental information. Uh, we have about 120,000 structures in the PDB. What is the experimental method that determines most of those? Any idea? How can you determine a structure? X-ray crystallography. Any idea 
what most means, what fraction of the structures, the protein structures in the PDB are, are extra crystallography? Ballpark? Anybody? Nobody? Percent. Somebody saw the slide. Uh, <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> I'm setting you up, I'm sorry. Uh, you did very well. Uh, unfortunately, it does not give you... Uh, this, this grade is not taken over to the examination, I'm afraid. Uh, but, so, uh, this is last year, uh, in May, 120,000 uh, structures, and fair enough, exactly pretty much 90% uh, uh, Daniel, as Daniel predicted, are done by extra crystallography, about 10% by NMR, uh, and about 1% by electron microscopy. Uh, X ray crystallography. So, what you do first is you grow a crystal out of your protein. How do you do that? How do you get your protein to form a crystal? So essentially you will have to express it a lot, a lot, a lot. So what that means in terms of when you look at typical cell biologists, the amount of uh, protein that they need is at least 10 to 50 times larger. So they really need a lot of purified protein. Express, purify and collect it and then hope that this density will lead to the growth of a crystal. Growth of a crystal means essentially a crystal is something where you have a repetition in a lattice of the same molecule again and again and again, just like diamond. Except for in diamond you have the lattice formed by carbon, by a single molecule, uh, while here you have it formed by a macromolecule. Right? But again, in every single unit cell of this crystal you have the same protein the same state essentially with slight differences but essentially in the same state then you shoot x-ray beams upon it uh, and when you take the subway going to Großhadern there's this thing about the Bragg reflection uh, that gave a Nobel Prize uh, is this, this, this drawing on the wall, I don't know, look at it. Uh, and that ultimately is exactly what this is about. The way atoms diffract X-ray beams. Okay? This is what you do here. And what you essentially see is the probability where the electrons, electrons sit. So an electron density map is what you get. This is a consistent signal that comes from the fact that your X-ray shines on many of these unit cells in the, sa in the same way. The same residue is always at the same position. That gives a consistent signal that you Fourier transform and that gives you essentially electron density. So sort of indicated by that, by, by, by that here. The phasing is the Fourier transform. Uh, and then you fit an atomic model into that. Fit means essentially you, ch you, you know for every single residue what the electron density of that residue would be. You know your sequence and you simply see, is that looking like the valine? If that looks like a valine, what's the other residue? And what is the next part of the electron density? Does it fit to my next residue or is it a different valine? And you sort of slide it through and begin to model. Okay. Now, the major problems in this here, uh, initially people, uh, uh, 20 years ago, people believed that the major bottleneck here is crystallization. Today we know that there are many steps that are bottle, equal bottlenecks. So the purification is as much a bottleneck. So to get enough of the protein material that is purified enough to grow, that you can grow a crystal is a bottleneck. To grow a crystal is a bottleneck. Once you have a crystal that diffracts very cleanly, so diffracts very cleanly, essentially you have this really the same unit cell. You don't have some, uh, some, some, some unit cells looking different, giving a non clear signal. Uh, so a clear crystal that diffracts very well. The moment you have this crystal and you go to your machine, there are very few machines in Germany at this point that can, really can do protein crystallography. One is in Hamburg. Uh, the, the largest one is in CERN, at CERN in Geneva. So you need large machines. Uh, and in the US, in fact, for many years, most of these large 
uh, accelerators or machines for high energy physics, most of them, for most of the time, did X ray crystallography uh, about 10 years ago. I'm not sure what, what the situation is today, but I assume it's still the same. So, once, so it's very expensive to get your beam time. Once you have a crystal, once you have the beam time, to get so this electron density map fitting here, today it takes days. Uh, ballpark. So it can be even faster. So within a day you can have a structure. Uh, when you're lucky, when have you when have a good crystal in an end. Uh, sometimes it takes a little bit longer, but days is, is the right number. Okay? So getting to this point here and then putting it the beam in, into the beam, that is the bottleneck. Here's NMR, about 10% uh, of the structures. The beauty of NMR is all you need to do is take your protein, put it into a solvent, into a pipette, put the pipette into a magnet. Put a big, 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 big mag magnet on it and see the relaxation signal. Uh, and from the relaxation signal, essentially what you get is proximity of protons. So you get a contact map or distance map. Okay, now these machines, you may observe there's a person up here. So this is a, it used to be a very large machine. I mean, it still is a big machine, uh, but today they are even bigger than magnets. Uh, a few years ago, that was the biggest. That is, this is both in the New York Structure Center, uh, City College in New York. Uh, that's the room in which the 900 stands and a few other machines stand. So you come anywhere into, so in order to make this photo, if, if you had made this photo with a credit card on you, then the credit card would be, much less useful afterwards. Uh, anything that you have that has a magnetic stripe on it is gone by the moment you're standing in this room. Without any magnet running, just, you know, being in the room is enough. Uh, these, these things are amazingly strong. Uh, so the, the magnetic power in this room is amazing. Anyway, uh, so the shielding this room uh, cost many million dollars alone just you know to have something around so that the people outside of the room can still have credit cards even that mechanism costs a lot of money uh, so here it's it's also about machines that are dedicated to that experiment that is one bottleneck but the other bottleneck comes next so what you get out of it is this and you immediately see that you're not seeing one particular structure but uh, maybe 20. You have 20 different solutions. Why? Because what you get out of it are distance constraints. And these distance constraints are compatible with 20 different solutions. In order to get to 20 and not 2000, in fact you need many measurements. And you need a long assignment moment. I said the moment you have your crystal you put it into the beam if the crystal is good, you get a structure within days. Here, once you have all the measurements done, this is many months for an expert. For somebody, an expert is defined as somebody who has done, has spent many, many years. So this is not many months for a, a pre-doc, but it's post-doc months for, for somebody who has done a pre-doc in NMR spectroscopy. So this is highly non-trivial to get from the point of the experimental data to actually getting these. 20 different models. Because, what's the problem here? The problem here is that in NMR you see proton distances. Now the proton distances you may see is a leucine isoleucine, but there are many leucine isoleucine pairs in your protein. Many possible ones. And to find out which one that actually is that you see the signal for requires many additional measurements plus allows you a lot of freedom. This also is the problem for longer proteins. So at some point, the longer the protein, the more this problem of not being able to say whether it's a uh, valine at position 1 or a valine at position 9. At some point, this problem explodes so much that you can no longer do it. And this at the moment is in the ballpark of 200. So proteins much longer than 200 NMR cannot handle. Most proteins, as you know, are longer than 200. At least most proteins are two domain, and uh, by that they are longer than 200. So NMR cannot do them. NMR can also not do protein-protein uh, interactions because most of those involve two proteins that are longer than 100 each. Uh, in, in some cases it can, but again, so this is exceptional. Uh, NMR really is the solution for short single domain proteins. Now, 
there are two interpretations of these uh, 20 different solutions. One interpretation is the data is not good enough to have a single answer, so you could say this is error, right? And in fact, often crystallographers make this point that this is not good enough. And MRI spectroscopists put 20 structures in there because they don't know what the answer is. That's the extreme way of putting it. And MRI spectroscopists counter and say, wait a minute, proteins move. What I see here is some places where, in fact, you always get the same answer. Where I know exactly what the solution is. And I know exactly what the solution is here and not here, because this one moves and this one doesn't. Okay? This is because I see the dynamics of the protein. I see where movement is and functionally important movement. Uh, here, here, here it's not only the end. Uh, and where, in fact, things are much better defined. Uh, so the difference here is a measure for diversity that is functionally relevant. That's the counter argument of spectroscopists. And I believe, so there are examples to be made for both, both sides. So clearly there are examples where, where there are just mistakes in there, in MR, where the measurements are just not good enough. And clearly there are examples where really the, the, the difference tells you about function, and it's a biologically relevant difference, it's not a mistake. Okay? Both of these situations are true. Now we get to another order of, of doing things, or something, cryo-EM, cryo-electron microscopy. Uh, in fact, that was a Nobel Prize this year, last year. Uh, and for last year, uh, for cryo-EM, from somebody who, who did his PhD um, at the TUM, and is now at Columbia University. Uh, cryo-EM, at the point at which I made this one here in 2000, last year in May, uh, there was only 1% cryo-EM, but this number is growing incredibly more than, than all the others. So in the future this will change. Cryo-EM will become the, one of the major ways to determine structure. Now the downside to cryo-EM is, so cryo-EM happens at this point on, on everything between 32 angstrom and 4 angstrom. So that's high, good resolution and that's relatively low resolution. Uh, low, uh, not good, or whatever you say. Uh, good is it slightly different. Uh, not, uh, uh, this one just does not see detail. So all you see of the structure is the outside shape as a blob. Here you see the outside shape in much more detail. You, you begin to see really there are balls, right? There are holes. There are uh, some aspects here. You still only see the surface. You're not looking inside. Okay, in order, how could you get from this one here to the actual 3D coordinate model for inside? How could you do that? So, one idea, and this is an example where it worked. Uh, there are several groups working on it. Andre Charlie, uh, who I will present later today, is another person who works on it. You essentially try to build models that fit into these 3D structures. So, I said, Modeling a 3D structure from first principles alone doesn't work. But maybe this constraint modeling, this constraint modeling where you know not only everything moves to every point, you know that on the surface it has to look like this. Okay? And that is a clear constraint. And this is what people try, uh, and often it succeeds. Uh, sometimes you can use homology information. Again, I get back to that. Uh, but this, typically at this point, is still on the level of every single time this succeeds, this is one publication. Not on the level where, where I have one method published and that method does the next thousand proteins. So this is still very, very individual, so to speak. Uh, I talked about the density map and resolution and how you fit the model into the density map. Again, I show image, not again, I show images here for one angstrom, two, 2.7 and 3 angstrom resolution. This is the lowest resolution and lowest resolution, I cannot make it much darker. I'm, uh, I'm afraid that the quality is just, this is as good as you get, as it gets. Um, so you may, some, here you see the blue. That's the electron density map. Here you sort of see the mesh, the wire mesh, much less clearly. But ultimately the fact is for 3 angstrom, the lower resolution, you, you see that the ring here, you can put in different ways. Whether you put the ring like this, like this, like this, like this, it's all compatible with the experimental data. Here, it's not. 
there's only one solution. You see an electron density map essentially for every atom here. Not only for the, for the molecule, right? Not only for the residue. You see it even sub parts of the, the residue. While in this particular case, essentially, these, you see that something big is in there. Uh, and you see that this is an aromatic ring. You see the residue of the type, but, but this is all you get at 3 angstrom, right? Is this message clear? I believe. Uh, okay, so now we have 3D structures, but when we look at 3D structures, and I, I'm missing a, uh, an image here to make this point, you can see many things for this one here that you cannot see. No, I don't have the right image. So uh, when you just see the balls and stick model, you, you don't clearly recognize as much as when you see secondary structure. So that brings us to the question, how can I get to secondary structure from 3D structure? Uh, why is there a secondary structure? So one way in which you sort of would discover a secondary structure, if I gave you 100 structures to look at in, 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 as homework, um, then most likely after, after some of those you will simply begin to see things that are repeated. You will see helices, you will see beta strands, you will see some bulges, you will see some sort of other things. Uh, you will recognize that there are patterns or something that you see again, again and again. And those are secondary structure segments. Why are they there? And here comes one answer to that. Uh, secondary structure is stabilized by hydrogen bonds. So they are there, this implies, because they are energetically favorable. And that statement comes from Linus Pauling. Uh, and Linus Pauling had uh, two sets of publications here in 1951 uh, in PNAS and in 1953 in PNAS. Uh, so I quote two papers here. I believe it was a t total of eight papers that were published, uh, four and four or something like that. Uh, two of these eight made a prediction of something that was observed. Six of these eight didn't. Two of the eight gave a Nobel Prize. Six were forgotten. Uh, so six were wrong, but you know, who cares about being wrong six times if you're twice right, uh, in some sense. Uh, that is what he, in 54, got the Nobel Prize for. And the idea again is helices are stabilized by hydrogen bonds that are formed between essentially residue I and I plus four, residue I plus one, and, oh, uh, and I plus 5 and so forth. So you form a set of hydrogen bonds, right? And when this breaks, the I plus 4 hydrogen bond pattern breaks, helix ends. Okay? In the beta strand, you have two strands that come together, and there the residues are always one, two residues apart that form hydrogen bonds to the other strand, and together they form a sheet. Okay? Uh, and this is how you get from something where you cannot recognize the similarity between red and green to something where, well, my mistake is I should have repeated this here and, and, and showed you that now you could recognize that these are two identical uh, segments. But now if I show you secondary structure like this or like this, either way you can immediately sort of see some features in the structure that you cannot see from the bolts and stick model. Uh, okay, he got a Nobel Prize in 54. When was the first structure done? Before or after? What do you believe? Before? So surprisingly, the answer is after. Uh, two first structures from Max Perutz and John Kendrew. 53, 60, myoglobin, hemoglobin. And this in itself is an interesting story. So this guy is older than this guy. This guy is the supervisor of that guy. This guy works for 10 years on, on determining the protein structure of hemoglobin. Then this guy comes as a postdoc. And he actually has myoglobin. He knows how to treat myoglobin and, and purify it. Uh, and becomes, works in his lab and he gets the first structure. Why do you believe that gets the first structure? Just looking at it. Small. Easier. Lucky, huh? <laughs> you just have to be a student. Uh, and you're luckier than your supervisor. 
Uh, in this particular case, this really worked out that way. Now, is there anything else you, you notice in these first two structures? So in 1960, we had two structures. In 1966, we also had two structures. In 1967, we had three. And the one that was added in 1967 had the same feature that you see here. Is there anything that jumps at you? Right. So this is, I uh, remember Pauling got the Nobel Prize in 54. And uh, in 60, we suddenly see two structures and they're only helices. And he got the Nobel Prize for beta strand and helix, I mean, for, for secondary structure uh, formation. For those two, they, 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 they believe they have evidence. And there we are. And there comes structure number three, also all helix. And people got nervous <laughs> with the Pauling Nobel Prize. Um, Okay, so we assigning secondary structure, we can see things more clearly uh, on the 3D structure. Assigning secondary structure ultimately is, I say that this particular position is an H. This particular position is an E extended. And this particular position or residue is in an L. The moment I do this assignment, at the end of the day, I get a string. Secondary structure is essentially 1D. It's a string. The word secondary is, is slightly misleading. Sometimes people call it second 2D structure. It's not at all. Essentially, ultimately, at the end of the day, it's a 1D string. You have for every single residue, you say this is H, E, or L, for instance, in a three state. But my question to you now is, how can you, from 3D structure, determine secondary structure? How can you assign that? So let, let's 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 do it in the in the group business. Thanks. Um, so that means that similar sequences have similar structures. So let's begin. And those slides come from Andrea Schafferhans. So we have here the oncogen KRAS uh, in its structure. Now this is KRAS point mutant in red, where at position 12. The glycine is mutated into a cysteine. That's the red structure. What you see where they differ, differ is in the binding site. Tiny difference. This difference causes cancer. So this tiny difference, because it leads to a different binding, really is relevant for function. Okay? Now, on the level of structure, of course, these two things essentially look the same. In fact, if I go down the KRAS is in human, I go down to 85% sequence identity, so I go to a molecule that has 15% of the residues different, rash. Uh, in human again, lime and green. Uh, lime is the rash, green is the RAS. And essentially you see that even down to the binding side here, even again, they, they slightly differ. But in fact, they have different specificity. They are doing different things. But still, the structures slightly different things. But still, the structures are very, very similar, right? Now, if I went further, and now I'll go to fly here, and I have a protein in orange, uh, RAP6, uh, that has 28% sequence identity. So now 72% of the residues are different. To, with respect to K, K RAS. Uh, you still see that the orange essentially looks the same, even the binding side. Now going further, uh, and in this alignment what this one says that most proteins in, in a large family here are in fact bacterial, and this bacteria is the purple one here. The bacterial protein here is at 19%, so only 19% of the residues are the same. Uh, Again, for the entire RAS-like family, most of them are bacterial. Now we have different function, different things, but essentially the structure still looks similar. Right? Okay, now my question to you. Uh, I give you in the computer to create a random subset of proteins that have 20% sequence identity to KRAS. So you can create whatever you want, right? Random number generator, and you create a set of proteins. You create 100 proteins that have all the feature 20% sequence identity to KRAS. How many of those do you believe have been observed? Or how many of those do you believe would form a similar structure? So here, here I say that this one here, uh, it's no longer a KRAS, but the protein in the bacterium here, in fact, 
as, as you see, a similar 3D structure. How many of the ones that you will create, your 100 randomly chosen sequence or how, uh, randomly produced? So you're not going for database searches. You just randomly change residues until you get to the point where you get simply 19% sequence identity, randomly. And assuming that you don't do it like the first 19 are the same and everything else is totally different. Assume you, some, you somehow randomize it such that you, you constrain 19% 19, 19 of the position to be identical. And you do it 100 times. How many of those you believe will have a similar structure? Almost none. Almost none, exactly. Florian, you're totally right. So, almost none. Now, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. So, Underneath, in order to build this family that this tree showed here, we have something such as this H, uh, HSP curve for uh, the HVAL, <coughs> where we look at number of residues aligned, percentage sequence identity. So for long alignments, 19% is above the curve, meaning that every single pair of proteins observed here has a similar 3D structure. So come Florian says most of those will not have a similar 3D structure. I say he's right. Nevertheless, this curve says here, uh, when, when I have long alignments and I have 19% or, or just 20% or something like that, most of the ones I observe are in the blue region, meaning they have the same 3D structure. How can these two statements be true? They are true both at the same time. How? You see the, the problem, right? The problem is, I go into the database, I observe almost every single pair I see for long alignments, more than 20% sequence identity, has the same 3D structure. And almost every, every I don't know, 99% or something is, is, is really a very, very dominant number. Nevertheless, when I create in the computer 100 that have 20% sequence identity, Almost none of them has the same 3D structure. How can these two statements be true? Yeah? Because um, the ones that exist aren't random. Why not? Because they evolved by evolution. And that's particularly, evolution means constraint. This is exactly the constraint. The constraint is that the change should not be too dramatic to completely mess up the structure. If you mess up structure completely, you mess up function. If you mess up function, this thing will not survive. And that is the evolutionary constraint. Evolutionary constraint means you select things that are, are working, okay? That's why what we see is very different from what we create in the computer, okay? Again, so uh, the h value is the difference from this curve. Uh, now, comparative modeling then, uh, I'm gonna, gonna zip over a few slides. Comparative modeling tries to see, so there's a bunch, uh, thanks to Christine Orengo, I briefly already introduced CAF, uh, that goes back to Christine Orengo and, and Janet Thornton. And for me, it all started when, when I first, when they first showed this, this slide here in 97, actually there were three of these, uh, in a paper, in which they simply said, here is uh, an example of all the type of structures that we have. In 97, they did fit on three of these slides. Uh, and you simply saw they're very different, so all alpha here, uh, there's some all beta, and there's very different shapes, very different types of shapes. And then homology modeling is essentially asking the question, if you have a sequence of a protein for which you do not know the structure, and you have the structure of another one that has a similar sequence, does it fit to that shape? Okay? Uh, we can do the following thing. We have a query sequence here. We have a protein in the PDB for which we know the three-dimensional structure. We simply say the sequence identity is high enough so that I can say my query sequence will look like that structure. Okay? That's the idea of comparative modeling. Is that clear? Everybody? Good. Uh, now the question is, how far do I reach with that? So how much can I do with that? Uh, so the whole pie here is, is symbolizing all my pro all known proteins. And it's not quite true because I'm actually looking at all the proteins of a known structure. Or, or some subset, I kind of remember what the subset is. <coughs> and it's an old estimate from 1992 and it's much, these numbers are much higher th th today. Anyway, so roughly at the time I had 13% for which I had experimental structures. You know already this number is smaller today. We have 120,000 and 111 million sequences. 
So the, the number is smaller today. But the others will get higher. 13% 30, 30 of the proteins for which I have, have structures. Uh, by the way, there's one issue in the PDB. Most of it, we talked about that already, 100% uh, sequence identical to each other. So effectively, the, the power of PDB is only for the ones that are not identical to others, right? And again, so the way you do homology modeling, you take a sequence of unknown structure, you find a similar protein, sequence similar protein in the PDB of known structure, you simply say that U has the same structure as H. You go above this HSP uh, value, for instance, or you stay in the twilight, upper twilight zone. So in the, in the daylight zone where, where sequence, sequence, and, and profile, uh, sequence profile comparisons are enough, this is sort of the reach of homology modeling. Uh, if you go further down into the twilight zone by, by better sequence profile, 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 then this is roughly where you reach. And here we are. This is roughly true today. So half of all the proteins I can predict the structure for. So half of the 111 million I can predict for one region in this protein the structure by comparative modeling. Meaning there is some structure in the PDB that is sequence similar enough so that I can infer that my protein, my unknown, my query protein, one of the 111 million has a similar structure. And I simply look up the structure of the homolog. Okay? Again, I cannot reach into this midnight zone here. Uh, that is essentially the pi that, that remains un, uncovered. Uh, there is a slightly different coverage for different organisms. Uh, Homo sapiens has a higher coverage, just many things are optimized for that. Uh, but ultimately, for the other half, uh, the only thing that I can do is really do predictions in 1D, and that is what we're going to start next week. Uh, the, the story gets slightly different if I look at the coverage for an entire organism, and it, look, it looks slightly different for which genome view we have. For a genome view, the numbers go a little bit down, so when I said half, this is here, but again, it's an outdated view. Uh, it, it goes down to a quarter or something like that. The good news is, in this particular case, if you wait, uh, and again, this is a long time ago, but the coverage increases simply not doing anything by the growth of the database. So you put one tool into the database, this is the way this was created, and you run it again uh, four years later, and you see it increases from this to that. That's the great news of, of comparative modeling. Okay. Um, so from Jinfeng comes come some of the, um, um, the following data. So Jinfeng did his PhD at Columbia University and, the, the, and is now a senior research assistant, uh, is a senior research scientist at Genentech has been since a while, 11 years now, but he did his PhD with 16 publications. First author. <laughs> okay, so some people are just, you know, how did he do it? So in the US, PhD is longer, so that is what I have to, do, to, to say, but some people are just outstanding. Uh, try, to, try to beat that. Um, not, not many can. <laughs> anyway, um, so th this essentially looks at different organisms, and, uh, and I'm going to zip through the slides from Zinfeng. Uh, and I'm also going to somehow zip through most of these slides. Uh, let's begin with the word up there, homology modeling, comparative modeling. Those essentially are two different words for the same thing. The strategy that I just explained to you, uh, some people historically was called homology modeling, later comparative modeling. The reason really is homology implies some evolutionary connection. The comparative modeling doesn't. And for this, ne you're not necessarily benefiting the most from the evolutionary most connected one. Uh, there is a target and a template. That's the, uh, the lingo that you will see in the field. Target essentially is your query protein, the one for which you do not know the structure. Template is essentially the protein for which you know the structure. And it's a template in the sense that you take part of that structure and copy it onto your target, onto your query, right? Um, so this is the one you look out, you search with the sequence, you find those two as 3D structures 
known 3D structures in the PDB and then you essentially copy the coordinates onto that one. Uh, and you, how do you implement a, a template in the database by the simple sequence alignment methods that I showed you so far? And sort of in the, there is the safe zone, I talked about that, in which essentially uh, you make some mistakes in the alignment, but the, the whole process is relatively simple. Uh, aligning the target, again, as I said, typically done by, by Psyblast and then refined by Cluster and other methods. Uh, and then you build a model. Now, in building a model, and then you assess the model, and I'll get to some examples how that is done. Uh, uh, one way, uh, maybe we do it in the generic way, uh, how would you assess a model? Essentially, you would simply look at the 3D coordinates copied onto your sequence may imply that some residue, so you don't have the same amino acids, right? And for your amino acid, the, maybe you have two amino acids in your protein that are larger than in the template. In the template, you have a bond that is normal for smaller residues. If you copy the same onto your larger residues, suddenly there are clashes. Right? How could you, what could you do with a clash? If you see such a clash, what would you do? So this is a clash, and now what? Uh, is one of those questions that the answer is already there and this just too trivial or is it that we should stop? Stop or trivial? Thanks.